Can you hear me? Okay, hi everyone, welcome to, maybe we can wait a little bit until they close the door. Okay, so welcome to our session on before you know it, internet governance becomes irrelevant. Uh, my name is Farzan Abadi, I'm from Internet Governance Project at Georgia Tech, and uh, we have, um, so the title of this workshop is pretty provocative and probably that's why you're here. Uh, but um, it's uh, more, it's not really a statement, it's more of a observation or a question whether it is becoming irrelevant because of this uh, technical um, development that we are seeing on the internet. So um, I'm not, so this is gonna be a very interactive session. So if you, ha if you are very opinionated about this issue, that's very good. So what we are gonna do is that you can interrupt any speaker you want. And if you think that you disagree with them, you can disagree with them. And we allow that. So there's no interact action after speakers uh, speak. You can, um, you know, you can speak whenever you want. But of course, you know, the general principle of not interrupting is good. <laughs> so, uh, and uh, so to lay out the problem and the issue, I'm just gonna go to Christian uh, Kaufman here and he can just lay out the issue and then we will, and also Jeff is online. So Jeff Hassan and Christian are going to lay out the issue and tell us what the problem is or if, it's a, if it is a problem. And uh, then we can uh, talk about how we can resolve it or uh, what sort of internet governance evolution we are seeing here. So without further ado, go ahead, Christian. Thanks. <laughs> so my name is Christian Kaufman. I guess I'm qualified or classified in this group as technical community. Um, I have multiple hats, but two hats are probably relevant for today. So one part is I work for a CDN called Akamai in my day job. And I'm also uh, heavily involved with different internet exchanges. And I'm currently on the board of one of them, actually the one here in Paris, uh, the France IX. Uh, when we talked about the panel today, or what actually brought up the panel today, is a, a trend we have seen, I guess, in the technical community. Uh, which is the consolidation of players, especially when it comes to the content. So before the, I don't know, 10 years ago, so um, you had a lot of content players, a lot of websites and a lot of, uh, the content was very distributed from a players in the ecosystem perspective. That has, especially with social media and some uh, big companies, uh, changed quite a bit. So I guess right now a typical eyeball network has, and these are rough numbers, right? The market might slightly change, but you probably have a roughly 10 players which make 70, 80, 90% of your traffic. Uh, so the content and the traffic you are getting coming from very few players. So this is one uh, data point for today's conversation. The other one is uh, we used in the past, I guess we as the internet operators, um, two or three fundamental ways how we delivered the traffic. One of them is the classical transit. So you have a transit supplier, you buy transit from that supplier. Uh, you had peering. This involved either direct peering or uh, P&Is or over an internet exchange. Um, and the last part, which was specific for CDNs and some of the content parties, you could have a cluster in your network from that particular provider, and then you got the traffic from there. Um, I think what we have seen in the recent years, and especially in the last one or two years, is that the whole traffic which is flowing via transit and even via the internet exchanges is actually not growing to the same degree as the rest of the ecosystem. So the internet still grows, you, um, you, know, you have broadband uh, penetration which gets higher, you have more content, but uh, the players or the delivery method as in transit or internet exchanges is not growing to the same degree. They're actually, some of them are flatlining. If you look at the very big ones, uh, they publish their stats like in AMSIX or in DKICS, you actually see that the last year is relatively moderate or even flat in comparison to what we have seen before. So. A lot of traffic these days either goes from a content owner, whoever that is, straight into a cloud via cloud on-ramp. Then it is in one of the three, four, five big cloud providers and then either they deliver it via their own CDN 
or they give it to a third party CDN and then that one delivers it. Um, so the traffic flow, instead of going a lot through the internet, the public internet or the internet exchanges is now bouncing between these big enterprise networks before it goes straight into um, the IBON network. If that continues this trend to the degree we have it right now, then I guess, um, do I bring up the questions or is that your job? <laughs> <That's me. laughs> so, uh, but this uh, traffic consolidation actually might have internet governance implications. But we, before we discuss those implications, we need to understand what internet governance is and what the definition is because it is very important also in this IGF because a lot of the issues that are being discussed in this meeting are really not inter global internet governance issues. So what we mean by internet governance are the policies, the best practices and the standards that shape cyber, cyberspace. And, uh, and the traffic consolidation might affect um, any of these uh, aspects of, the, of internet governance. Ted, you had to uh, add on to the definition of internet governance. Yeah, I was uh, going to say that our, our definition of it is slightly differently. I'm Ted Hardy from the Internet Architecture Board. And it's the set of tasks that are required uh, to keep the internet open, interoperable, and globally interconnected. And so those tasks aren't just associated with government entities, right? The governance may be uh, in part due to regulation. It may be in part due to the action of standards bodies, making sure that there are interoperable protocols. It may be in part due to the market forces, which are keeping uh, the voluntary nature of it uh, as part of their uh, interaction with the market. So um, given that set of tasks, I think the question that's really being asked isn't so much um, is the Internet governance, is that set of tasks going to go away, but is it going to change? And I think that the, the implication of the, 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 the blog posting that Jeff put out and that uh, Christian has elaborated a little bit is that there are traffic patterns which are changing, um, and do they involve or imply evolutions in the set of tasks that we need to take on uh, to keep the Internet you know, open, interoperable, and globally interconnected? Okay, thank you, Ted. Uh, so I can see Jeff online. Uh, Jeff, if you're ready, if you could, uh, okay. Can we just- Okay, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Right. Um, what I'm doing right now is actually in today's internet, totally unique. And indeed, I might even be the only one in the country doing it right now. Because I'm sending packets from Australia to France. Now, you know, five years ago, that would be commonplace. The internet is there to ship packets all around the world, but that doesn't happen anymore. The internet not only will change, but in the last five years, it has changed dramatically. And indeed, it's hard to actually understand what the internet is anymore. We built this network, we built this internet as a computer facsimile of the old human telephone network that people talk to people and computers talk to computers. The idea that there was these mainframes that assumed all of these kinds of end roles and that any computer could talk to any other computer. But we didn't understand what was happening in the silicon world. And when we shrank the computer and kept on making it cheaper and more numerous, computers became specialized. And there were client computers and server computers servers delivered content and clients received it. So the network became asymmetric. Most of the edge of the network where you and I sit as users are actually on the client side. And what we were doing was using a network to access a service. But this idea that there is a service point, that there is a unique point where this service is available is at best, 2000s concept and probably a 1990s concept because it takes a long time to get packets around the world and the service folk knew that and so what we started to do was replicate service all over the world that rather than having one point of delivering service we started to have hundreds and then even thousands the service point was just around the corner just at the other end of your access network so now, instead of the network bringing the user to the service, the client to the service, the service has come and knocking on the door of the client. 
what's the network role in that point? If the whole idea was that we were meant to be building this transit network, what's actually happened is the network has disappeared. The transit to actually deliver service through all these CDNs has been privatized. All the world's submarine cables that are being built these days, the vast majority of them are now privately funded, privately run by content distribution networks. Royal Christian might optimistically believe that there are at least 10 people who now publish content. My own pessimistic view is that there are no more than five. And if you don't use one of those five, your content is no longer assuredly available because the rest of the internet is now so toxically irradiated, so full of attacks, so full of malicious actions that bring your, bring your content down. There are about only five folk who can publish your network and withstand this level of attack. So we've managed to aggregate the service world and collapse the internet. But it's a little bit worse than that, because not only is there no peering anymore and there's no transit, those five players are immense. They're larger than most governments in terms of the amount of money represented in shareholder capital. That not only is the aggregation of content, but there's aggregation of value. And that we seem to be building right before our eyes, another gilded age, another age when a very small bunch of, of, of players completely dominate our world. So what do we mean when we talk about governance of the internet? and the internet has done the incredible shrinking job and become almost nothing. What do we mean when now the content is now largely dominated by a very small number of aggregators, that your, your content is no longer visible unless you use one of them? And if one of them don't want to publish your content, if none of them do, what happens then? So to my mind, governance is fine when this is a large participatory competitive, competitive process where there are many ways of doing the same thing, where interoperation becomes important. But that's a historical concept now. The network we see it now is heavily aggregated, heavily controlled, heavily centralized in private hands. What's the role of governments when dealing with entities that by and large have a better touch with all of your citizens, have a better idea of exactly what they're doing because the way they, they achieve this degree of content aggregation, content domination, is by obtaining an intimate view of each and every client. A market, a mass market, if you will, of one. So when we talk about governance now, I'm not sure that we understand what we're talking about. We're certainly not talking about a network. The network doesn't exist as a public artifact. That's gone. Hearing, that's gone. The whole idea of transit and moving packets around the world, well, apart from what I'm doing right now, that's gone. So what we're talking about now is an entirely different world, a world of content and a world of service, where in fact, there is a very narrow and constrained pipe between the folk who are publishing and the folk who are receiving. And that pipe is dominated by a very small number of private players who effectively have moved so quickly, moved so rapidly in advance of, of our normal world, that the regulatory structures, the entire framework of control, of participation, of accountability, seems to have been ripped up. That these folks set their own rules, just as they did in the Gilded Age, and then present them back to governments and to users, saying, well, here are the new rules, I hope you like them but there's no negotiation. These rules are absolute. These rules are now rules that effectively the rest of us must abide by rather than determine for ourselves. So when you talk about internet governance being perhaps irrelevant in the future, I suppose the reality is the network has done the incredible shrinking trick. There's probably no network left. And that what's left is hardly a governance issue in terms of networking, there is a very big issue in terms of free speech, in terms of access to information, dissemination of information. But these are very big social topics 
It's actually the public space we're talking about. Uh, sorry, Jeff, before you move to your next point, can you rather make... than the internet governance. Jeff, hello. Thank you. No. Okay, before you move to your next point, uh, we have a comment from Mike Nelson from Cloudflare here. Sorry, we, we have an interactive session, so anyone can just interrupt. <laughs> Jeff, sorry to interrupt you. I always learn a lot when I listen to you, and I learn a lot when I read what you write. But I, I think it would be useful to differentiate between the social media companies at the top of the stack, the security companies that are providing certs, and the, the domain name companies, and then at the very bottom, companies like ours, Content Distribution Network, and below that even, the networks themselves. I mean, our, our, our network, connects 150 data centers, we're the most peered network in the world. And our whole goal is to make sure that everybody's connected to everybody. We're particularly concerned not about content, we're concerned about computing power. And so we're very worried that one or two cloud companies will control the cloud. Our answer to that is to make sure everybody can connect to whatever cloud they want. And so I, 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 I worry that what you're saying is one nightmare scenario if everybody decides to be the ugly monopolist. Some of us are fighting very hard to constrain ugly monopolists and to provide for a multi-cloud environment and to connect everybody to everybody and to not be the gatekeeper no matter how many governments want us to be. Thanks, Mike. The, the problem is, of course, that by and large, security has failed us. And it's not the fault of the experts, it's not the fault of, of the erstwhile folk who are fighting the good fight, but our software systems, our hardware systems are incredibly fallible. And those fallibilities have been used now to the point that we can't defend each and every website. A bit like Norman, Norman England, if you want security these days, you have to live in a castle. You have to live in a castle that can withstand a terror bit of attack. Very few folk can build those castles. And it'd be nice to think that we could all build our own castle that can withstand massive DDoS attacks. We can't. And in fact, there aren't a whole bunch of folk who can build that scale of castle. And indeed, I think on this panel, you've, you've at least got two, and the other three aren't far, aren't far away, that irrespective of what we would like, the reality is, if you want your content to be always available, to withstand all forms of toxic, malicious attack, security failure has meant that you have to live in one of those very few castle hotels of content. And like it or not, the outcome is that there are very few mediums to actually push your content out these days. This is not what we planned, but reality seldom is. This is the reality we live in today. Thanks. Can I be more explicit? Is Cloudflare one of your? Do, do you have a castle? We want. We, we don't. We we give we give twelve million websites their own castle, and we op are open to all comers. I mean, we're we're giving them the infrastructure to fight off all the bad guys, and and I'm, um, hear, I'm you're hearing one of the five, Mike. Yes. Just wanted to make that clear, but I, it, it is very different to be low in the stack and high in the stack. Okay, so I might have to moderate you guys. So um, I just so I can see that there is a comment there, and um, then we are going to go to to you have a comment as well. Right? And, all right, go ahead, please. Uh, Peter Snolly, Internet. Uh, sorry, um, Electronic Frontiers Australia. Um, you say that Cloudflare is providing this this bandwidth, this this platform, but Cloudflare is actually providing a bottleneck. For example, those people who um, use Tor. So, Cloudflare, whether it's wh whether it's on purpose or not, Cloudflare is actually contributing. You, you, you clearly haven't read the last three blogs we've written about this because we have made some <laughs> no, real progress on this. No, I'm a pragmatist. <laughs> so, uh, all right. Thank you very much for being so interactive. Um, but uh, I think Ted has a comment, and then uh, Jeff, uh, if, if you want to uh, wrap up after uh, Ted's comment, then that would be great. And um, so we are here to understand whether um, the 
traffic consolidation is a, an actual problem that, like with regards to standard setting policy rights, so with regards to like, various aspects, and nothing is, in, is set in stone. I mean, Jeff might think that this is a huge problem, and someone else might think that it's not a problem. So we are not really deciding anything now. It's just like uh, the issue to be out there to be discussed by the community later on. Go ahead. Uh, Ted Um There are a couple of points I wanted to make. One is that what Jeff is doing right now is, in fact, not at all unusual. Uh, one of the major uses of, of the network that we see is peer-to-peer -peer, um, uh, video and audio traffic. Um, he, he talked about us imitating the telephone network, and in, indeed we still do, uh, because you have a very large number of uh, RTC web-based um, uh, mechanisms for enabling peer-to-peer -peer, uh, video and audio to go among different people. And I think one of the things that's interesting about that is that the traffic patterns you see there are in fact very different from the traffic patterns you would get with content consumption. Um, in terms of absolute numbers, it may not be um, uh, quite the same as content consumption. Certainly dash-based video at 4K consumes a lot of bits. Um, but it is important to recognize that both in particular uh, geographic regions and well beyond them, there's a lot of this going on. Uh, there are also still a lot of people building um, small-scale uh, web systems. We saw Let's Encrypt produce 100 million different uh, certificates uh, over the last year or so, and that's because a bunch of those people wanted to have access uh, to higher security and were rolling their own. Uh, lastly, I'll point out that um, although the, the existence of uh, cloud-based computing means that a lot of people have shifted uh, workloads to the cloud. It also means that there's now a very strong need for enterprises to be able to reach those clouds uh, securely and with low latency. And those, in fact, are network uh, protocols and do require the same kind of attention from standards bodies uh, that historically have gone to other kinds of workloads. So I think that there are there certainly changes. Uh, the, the internet exchange business didn't exist uh, 25 years ago. It was employee tenant Equinix. And, you know, we imitated the PACs and various other, other previous uh, uh, things, but it really didn't become a business uh, at the very dawn of the Internet. And the fact that it's changing isn't a particular surprise. It's part of the, the typical evolution. Uh, and the push of content toward the edge is really uh, a desire to avoid latency. So we can see these trends in, in uh, Internet technologies as uh, people attempt to optimize whatever application it is they're running on top of the network but they don't really change the need for the network. They may change the, the pattern of bits. The most important bit on your network may be the one that's doing cash fill for your CDN, but it's still a bit on your network that's crossing the network boundary and behaving as an internet flow. Um, and I think that we have to be careful in, in, in looking at these patterns not to extrapolate too far. Um, that evolution doesn't mean end, it means change. Thank you, Ted. Uh, Jeff, would you like to make a final comment? And then every, anytime you want to come back again, you can just take the microphone and discuss. Thanks, yes. Um, I suppose what I'd like to point out is that traditionally, the network has always been the point of control. In the telephone system, it was the telephone network, not the handsets, that became the point of the application of control the point where you had the orders to intercept, the orders to observe, because it was the common medium that everyone used. But the internet has changed all of that. And I, I'm, I, I simply just cannot believe that where we are now is similar where we were 10 years ago. Because there's no universal service obligation anymore. There's no care and attention to maintain universal reachability. Enterprises don't spend 90% of their money solving the last 1% of the problem. They spend 90% of their money solving the 90% problem. 90% of the traffic now is streaming traffic. The internet is almost replaced broadcast television with an almost similar underlying technical analogy that all it is is an access network into those local CDN points of presence. This idea that each company is not there to do a universal service for all of us, that each player is there to maximize its opportunities. There's no money left in default. There's no will to maintain default. The network isn't universally interconnected anymore. 
that when we analyse the various routing tables in each of these players, we see a disturbing trend that not everyone can reach everyone anymore. And perhaps even more disturbing, no one cares. It just doesn't matter. It's not a commercially important problem. The real problem is making sure that those well-known icons of, of content and media, the Netflixes, the Googles of this world, can deliver their content to you and I. And that's the two or 300 routes we really care about. And where does that traffic come from? A mere handful of players. So yes, it's not a future issue, it's a today issue. And this destruction of the network and replacing it with local access to a local point of presence of service is I suppose the thing we have to deal with now. And the real question is, is our old tools and techniques of multi-stakeholder participatory forums relevant to this remarkably constrained world that we've managed to build? Thank you. Thank you very much, Jeff. So um, I can just briefly wrap up what Jeff said. So internet governance is dead and we can just go home. Uh, so, and um, so this, um, the consolidation of traffic being in a few actors' um, hands on the internet might have an effect on internet governance. Um, but would that have effect on uh, standard setting did someone want to make a comment? Oh, Pablo, do uh, Okay, so before I go to Ted with that question, Pablo wants to make a comment, and then we'll go to Ted. It's just for the sake of context, because actually it's a, it's a good thing, and, and it feels a little bit weird to see Techie Talk here at the IGF, right? Uh, and with all the Cloudflare and Straight Talk that is proper to this technical community, I mean, for reference, uh, Jeff, Jeff is in his 2 a.m mood in, in Canberra uh, with an Aaron t-shirt, but Jeff is very much a pinic, right? Uh, back to the question at hand, I, I just want to help to contextualize as well this, uh, because I think it's important. The notion of internet governance that is being uh, worked here is, is interpreted as a, in a very strict operational sense. So these are standards practices that are the ones that run the networks, and, and we're talking internet governance in that sense here. Uh, but back to what Ted said, I mean, we're not talking, for example, about community-led uh, policy development processes or uh, policy uh, 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 processes to define uh, sort of um, bigger picture set of issues, right? And, and I think we need to, to, to differentiate sort of whether uh, the internet governance operational practices are changing in a very dramatic uh, way and, and to the degree that they are not more the ones that we were used to. And another different thing is at, at this level of communications, uh, at, at the level of sort of the speeches that we heard yesterday, uh, sort of these uh, policy setting uh, internet governance principles and uh, uh, decisions uh, that will be made at uh, sort of governmental, uh, regulatory, or uh, via multi-stakeholder kind of processes. So I just wanted to give that, that context and setting for, for the rest of the, um, of the conversation. Thank you, Pam. So I think we can, uh, Ted, you can just. So, so earlier on I said that uh, internet governance was the set of tasks it takes uh, to make sure that the internet remained a voluntary, interoperable, or, or open and interoperable, and globally interconnected. And I think that the main point that Jeff is making is that globally interconnected uh, has a different meaning now than it did um, many months ago, in that there are now large numbers of people who may not be globally interconnected and don't know it and don't mind. And the reason he's giving for it, based on the analysis he's done, is that most of the flows that they exchange with their peers on the network, uh, in, in this case clients talking to server in the content case he's talking about, don't require many of the, the routes it would take to make that global reachability real. And it's a very interesting and important point, but it, it also points to future work rather than saying we just give up. And so one of the things that uh, he's pointing to is the fact that if in, uh, in this situation you discover 
uh, that you want to trade traffic, let's say, from uh, Australia to Paris in order to participate in this, and you can't, the mechanisms by which you repair that are, are slow, cumbersome, and may not be in your control because they're in the control of some, somebody along the path between the two. And making uh, that sort of uh, network change may be something that right now is difficult because the presumption is that you're globally interconnected all the time. So we, we have a couple of options here um, to, to keep it interoperable and globally interconnected, one of which is to refocus, uh, I see you, Olaf, um, uh, on making sure that that global interoperability is a core value of the people who participate in the routing system. Uh, the ISOC manner system might be a vehicle for that. Uh, there's certainly uh, uh, methods for doing that by uh, reaching out to the operator communities, and, and frankly, Jeff has very, very good contacts there. Uh, if he's not doing it, there may be a reason. And the last is actually to make changes in the internet protocol stack so that um, pulling in a new route in order to accomplish one of these flows uh, takes place in, in much lower amounts of time than the current BGP convergence time. Uh, so I do see this and say, yes, this may change the kind of standard setting we need to do in order to maintain this, but I don't see this as saying it's not a good idea. I see it as saying the current situation has changed enough from the situation when we built the current networks or the current set of protocols that there may be a need for further evolution to meet the new conditions or to improve them. And hopefully um, that's a point at which uh, Jeff and I can agree. Yeah, Olaf Kolkman, Internet Society. Um, so I'm torn between the incredible big bucket of black paint that uh, uh, Jeff is smearing all over the place and uh, a somewhat more positive uh, 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 perspective on, on, on this, which I think you just captured. The only, that I think it was Citrain that said the Internet only just works. Um, basically, the Internet always finds its solutions to, to, to getting to a place where it it does provide that global inter in, in interoperability. But on the other hand, this all needs to be paid for. And my feeling is that the introduction of new routing protocols that might you know, replace PGP will be s subject to collective action problems. Um, and, and I think that the underlying story uh, uh, with Jeff is that once there is less value in transit, because there is less value to globally connect, and that's, a, that, that's sort of the projection I think that he's making, perhaps there's no way back. I'm s looking a little bit at Michael as the economist at the table um, and, and providing you a bridge, perhaps. <laughs> Uh, thanks for the, the lead in there. I, I just wanted to talk a little about the economics of this. Um, I mean, first of all, I should point out, uh, I think Ted, Ted raised this, but I mean, there's some uh, value to all this. I mean, when I was at the Internet Society, uh, we wrote two papers about the value of locally hosted content. It lowers latency, it lowers cost because you don't have to bring it across the ocean on the much more expensive inter intercontinental transit versus or uh, connections versus local connections. Um, so there's a great value in having content local, um, but now we're seeing there's a lot of, you know, there's always unintended consequences or often there's unintended consequences of that. And in this case, you know, there's this idea that there's going to, that there's some consolidation, um, that there's fewer and fewer of these that, that are um, gathering up all the traffic. But just running along the lines of, of Mike's intervention that there's a difference between the social media and, you know, the CDNs or cloud providers, uh, there's a big difference in consolidation or concentration that comes from economies of scale versus one that comes from network effects. So economies of scale, you know, we see in car manufacturing and a lot of industries in telecoms, a lot of industries we see economies of, of um, scale. Um, and in many ways, we benefit them. And whereas network effects, um, you know, nobody wants to be on a Facebook with 20 people or a social media with 20 people. You want the network, right? Um, and, and that presents a much different set of issues, uh, a lot of benefits, of course, but also a different set of market power issues. 
So in terms of the clouds, there's clearly economies of scale. If you're going to 150 data centers, you can't do that for one customer. You have to do that for a lot of customers uh, to make that worthwhile. And then it makes it harder to enter, but not impossible. Um, you know, you can enter with, you know, building a better mousetrap. Um, you can enter because some of the inputs are, are publicly available. You can get um, access to... Um, you know, dark fiber or build your own, some companies are doing, that would obviously raise your cost. But there is a way of entering. So I don't think when we talk about this consolidation to mix up what's happening with some of the operators above and what's ha you know, the social media companies versus the, the cloud, um, not setting apart some of the other issues raised, it's not necessarily the case that it's going to lead to this consolidation and, and it won't be possible to enter. Um, and I would also say that the Internet itself has a lot of network effects and economies of scale, the way that we're used to working, that we can connect and do video conferences from Australia to France without thinking about it, our email, everything we do has some kind of network effects that we don't want to give up access to this whole network. And the standards themselves are built into everything, and I don't think we want to have to buy a, you know, a computer or download a browser that only works with one cloud provider or CDN. Um, so it's, there's going to be a lot of inertia or positive eff efforts for everyone still staying on the same network and finding some other way to compete or exercise their market power. Well, it's interesting that you mentioned a different browser for different content. But if I look at this device, I've got an icon for Netflix and I've got an icon for Prime Video. So I, I, I'm not totally convinced by that argument, actually. Well, uh, yeah, so clearly, um, but that was built the other way, right? Apple came out with something new and they made it, you know, in their favor with an app store that they had control over and that's the other model. But whether someone could impose that on the open internet is a different story. Uh, but, but Michael, <coughs> Yes. My Google Home as my Google Home Assistant doesn't talk to Alexa. It only talks to Google. I'm like, when you're talking browser, are you talking 1980s? What we've done now is actually created a whole bunch of customized devices that are literally specialized to only talk to one service provider. And it's in every household now. We seem to be actually creating an entirely different world than the one you're painting where the access devices are not flavoured by the service they're delivering. I would actually argue the things that are coming out now are flavoured by the service they're delivering and indeed are locked against a single service provider and that's where the device market has already gone. It's hard to maintain your optimism in the face of that kind of observation. Well, I mean, my point was, it's kind of talking to the ceiling here, uh, uh, because we, we don't see your picture anymore, so it's a bit, it, it's a bit disembodied. We're, we're all trying to figure like out how Alexa. hard you're trying to maintain your optimism. <laughs> like Alexa, it's all disembodied. Um, no, my point was that you don't have to have everything Amazon to use Alexa. You certainly don't have to have everything that you're doing operating off the Amazon cloud but to use Alexa or vice versa that there's still, you know, some separations. And, yeah, it's, it's obviously changing it. And, and Olaf, you couldn't see, held up his, uh, his, I guess, iPad or one of those devices. And that's obviously changing some of the nature. But I think that's independent of what's happening in the core of the network and the consolidation that we're talking about here. That was mm. my point. I, I would agree with your point, but I, I think there's a component missing. Um, and that actually picks up on the enterprise connection which we had before and how potentially the clouds talk to each other or CDNs talk to the cloud. If you find a better way to actually, you know, uh, let's start with the enterprise example. If you have an enterprise connection to a cloud and you use it usually via a layer two, so there is no IP, right? What you then drive over it, which device you use, you can actually change that. You don't have to stay with the IP part necessarily especially if you find protocols where one cloud offers you a feature and say if you use that protocol stack or you know you change some parameters of it which don't work in the rest of the internet necessarily MTU, jumper frames, whatever you choose, random ones then um, you have a better performance and we give you a lower price. If that is your main cloud, I actually think most people would follow. The next part is if the CDNs and the clouds talk to each other um, 
and they find a standard, right, which works better for them, now you don't have to go through a lengthy process or necessarily involve hundreds of people. So you send an engineer each from each company and say, well, over these connections, we could actually do different things. We don't have to be using the lowest nominator, which is the internet. We can actually have our own part. And then to the outside, we react internet IP-wise again, right, that all the clients can connect, that's fine. But for the parts which we can optimize, we could actually do something different. Right. Um, yeah, I mean, my point was, would you, I mean, in the first scenario you laid out, would you want to be incompatible with everything else <laughs> because you're having some of your traffic going over this layer too? Would you want to give up compatibility with everything else? And would you, because you have to make sure everyone else goes along with you. Right? I mean, you... No, not for the connection. You, so you have two connections as the... Christian, sorry. Kaufman. Kaufman. <laughs> um, I think a, a company has multiple connections, right? You have one for the, for the internet, and you have one, probably a couple of MPLS or one connection to other offices, and one to the cloud. So now the, the cloud component doesn't have to take the um, nominator, the internet, right? You could actually change random protocols. You can even have an Amazon cloud box not giving them ideas, where you then connect to them, right, via dedicated protocols. And all of that would actually work much faster instead of going through a standardization body. So uh, I'd, I'd like to point out that, in, in fact, what you're talking about there is a differentiation versus uh, interoperability argument. Sorry, Ted Hardy uh, speaking. Um, and in, in particular, what, what you see in that situation is you, you can do um, optimizations either like in the services offered by the cloud or in the, the method by which you reach the cloud, uh, which are specific to that um, uh, service relationship, right? Um, and for an enterprise which is choosing that optimization, the result of that is they're losing interoperability with moving their, uh, their tasks or their, um, their service to a different provider. Um, and that trade-off, and we're gonna look at Michael again because this is economics in some sense, um, is, that trade-off is often made uh, and regretted later, right? People are like, oh, wow, I can save $50,000 a year if I, if I go with this uh, hyper-optimized MPLS connection to this one uh, cloud provider, and then I find out that I'm spending $60,000 extra a month uh, because I'm now a captured customer and I can't go anywhere else. Um, and people learn that lesson and then s tend to say, hey, it turns out I want to be able to run these workloads locally. I want to be able to run them in Azure. I want to be able to run them in GCP. I want to be able to run them in AWS. I want to be able to run them in whatever um, competitors appear in China or India or uh, other places where I care. And in, in those situations, the value of interoperability drives you toward a standardized solution. Um, and it then turns out it drives the, the standards to move up the stack from being the lowest common denominator uh, toward having uh, the same features or functionality that the people wanted the, um, the proprietary versions for um, because they still want the functionality and they can drive interoperable versions for it. And I think that kind of goes back to a point that was being made earlier. If you get to a point where you only need five people in the room to, to come to a consensus on what interoperable looks like, you have two possibilities. Either consensus emerges very, very quickly, uh, you, you get, um, some regulator coming and saying, you five people can't be in a room anymore together. Or um, you, you get to a point where one of them thinks they can win, that they don't need interoperability to the others because they can win whatever this market is and be the 80% player rather than the 20% player. And in that case, you never get to interoperability with that one, and then the other four go and do it without them. Mm -hmm. And and the. The reality is we have seen this all play out multiple times in the internet space. We've seen it in IM, we've seen it in database replication, we've seen it in other places. Um, and over the long term, uh, interoperability tends to win. And uh, Jeff may be right that there are changes in the, in the patterns of uh, behavior of uh, these content providers and changes in the patterns of behavior of the consumers of that content, but I don't think that that long term trend has changed. Okay, thank you very much. We have a comment from the floor. Please say your name and then... Um, all right, <laughs> thanks. Um, Juliana, it's a question actually. Because uh, considering those are private pr platforms and companies, uh, who do you think should, ad uh, should address the interoperability problem? Um, technical protocols or something such as antitrust uh, rules and uh, state regulation as a whole considering 
uh, those companies are not binded to the same transparency protocols uh, as a public service would be. Okay, so this is a very good question, which actually we want to address, but uh, based on Macron's uh, speech yesterday, that would be, of course, the governments who will regulate them. Uh, but <laughs> that was a joke. And uh, so, <laughs> so um, I am going to, uh, would you like to make a comment, but then I, we will go to the internet rights, which is like the exciting part of the session. Right, exactly. Michael, would you like to? Uh, yeah. Was it, yeah. Michael. So again, Keeping in mind these two layers, um, there's a, a lot of challenges for antitrust and regulation at the social media level. You know, if something is being offered for free, it's hard to assess the impact of, of a merger or any other activity, uh, at least in the way that antitrust is um, assessed in the U.S. Uh, Europe is a little more looking at the impact on competitors. But at the network level and the kind of where there's economies of scale, uh, there's nothing changed really. Um, uh, you know, the the tools are very good because they're all charging fees, and if uh, if they use these maneuvers to to merge their way in or collude their way into being able to raise rates in some way, antitrust is very good at um, at least within a country or the the EU. Antitrust is very good at uh, either blocking those mergers or. Um, assessing them afterwards. So I think at the network level, there's still uh, possibilities without having to get to regulation because ultimately antitrust is the means to not have to regulate. Thank you, Michael. So we have a comment from the floor and then. Peter Tonelli, um, but aren't we on the verge of this already? So for example, with Google Fiber, if you have Google Fiber and Google Caches website, so you've got Google AMP, that you'll basically never reach outside the Google network. Um, you've got an Android phone which speaks to the Google network, you use YouTube, you've effectively, you don't, you don't need the internet anymore. We're, we're already um, on that precipice, in my opinion. I'd be interested to hear what Jeff's opinion of that is. I'm trying hard to unmute myself. If you want a very quick reaction, the reaction is that Android now control about 80 to 90% of the mobile handset market in today's world. They certainly have an extremely dominant position. They have gone down the path of actually taking the protocols we use and hiding them behind a layer of encryption and using a proprietary version thereof. I only mentioned quick in passing, but similarly, there are a whole swag of technologies now where one player believes that it has critical mass in the market to not worry about interoperability, to actually forge an entirely unique path through the system and come out commercially just fine. So perhaps this whole issue of interoperability, Ted, is more like a pendulum, that when you get a highly disaggregated market, then every player strives to interoperate with every other. But in a highly aggregated market, the, the giants try to take those things, those assets off the table and privatize them. And whether the wall or the lever is encryption, so you can't see what's happening, or other mechanisms that simply remove the whole issue of interoperability and create dedicated attachments to a single service environment. Today's world, I must admit, looks much more like this latter model of interoperability because it's not regulatory. Interoperability becomes a secondary consideration. And the major consideration right now is actually aggregation and capture. And yes, I too feel that the giants are now so big that it's so difficult to understand what our leverage is. The Sherman Act in the early days of the 20th century in the US might have worked for US Steel, but they sure as hell don't work for Google. Thanks. So, so I have good news for you, uh, Jeff. Uh, this is Ted. Uh, and that is that uh, Google brought uh, Quick to the IETF some years ago. It's in the middle of standardization, and that Google uh, not only committed to turning down its flavor of it, it has been anxious to do so for over a year because the standards process has been a little slower than they liked. Um, but realistically, I think that um, the, the chances that somebody's going to build 
a proprietary protocol that they mean to run across the, the network and not want to bring people in. Uh, it's certainly possible, but it is not what's happened with QUIC, and we haven't seen examples of it at the transport layer in, in, in my experience of the Internet, which goes back a ways. Um, I, I'm told that I'm interrupting the rights discussion now, so I, I will stop talking. Thank you. So now we get to talk about the exciting part of this session. Uh, not that the previous one was not exciting, but we go to, you're from Access now. I do not know your name, so. so I, can, I can help you with that. So my name is Ramanjit Singh Chima. I'm uh, with the global policy team at Access now. I also help uh, chair the board of the Internet Freedom Foundation in India, which has worked on network neutrality amongst many other issues, and I'm going to use as an anecdote to talk a little bit about regulation. But about rights, and I, I, you know, I won't go into that in detail in terms of you understand about free expression, privacy, many other you know, issues there. What's interesting in this discussion, which is what I think regulators and government people say, although sometimes they say it as a preface for other interests, is to say, how do you enforce it? How do you hold people accountable on these issues? And I think the most interesting one, I'm going to give you the, the point here is, the, the, it's the internet governance problem, right? And we understand internet governance in a particular way, understanding from the Tunis agenda and from ICA and IANA and the ISOC universe. Uh, and as some of you may have heard yesterday with President Mac you know, Macron and others make fun of world leaders all the time, actually internet governance for them means something else. It means literally all the governance issues to do with the internet in terms of anything, any regulatory larger societal issue as well. Why I mention this is because some of the questions that, for example, you raised earlier about regulators and about rights connect with this. And I'll, I'll give you an example of network neutrality. The most active issue in terms of network neutrality, forward-looking thinking amongst many regulators is the issue of CDNs now as well. Even the most recent uh, positive example of network neutrality regulation, and positive I would say from the rights community's perspective, I know telcos in the room will disagree with me, uh, is for example in the Indian debate where they passed both regulation on economic discrimination, zero rating, and then they also issued recent regulations on technical discrimination, very similar to what the EU TSM and the BEREC guidelines have put in place and what the US had previously. The issue that's come up is how do you treat the issue of discriminatory behavior when it comes to both technical measures and economic measures. And the question that most people ask is, if CDNs give you a massive economic advantage or economic you know, market you know, benefit there, how do, you, how do you deal with this? And most people would say, rightfully so, maybe you don't have jurisdiction, maybe this is something that's already being addressed by the private sector. Maybe it's in fact unfair, correctly so, to treat CDNs in the same way as licensed telecom entities are, who are licensed, use spectrum, and are subject to international regulation. Uh, but the challenge I think you have is that it does have impact on, this, on the space. You don't have enough answers. For example, for many regulators globally, my initial steer to them has been to say, actually, you should talk to CDN providers or other cache providers or other actors on the ecosystem to find out what is happening in this marketplace. In terms of, for example, you know, understanding even the nature of how transit and peering has changed, and I remember your fantastic paper a couple of years ago on transit and peering. The reality is even from there, it, the marketplace has changed now. And the challenge for most people in this space, if you are, say, a human rights activist, a civil liberties group, a government regulator, an elected lawmaker or others, is actually, if you're not in this particular room, in this particular conversation, you know nothing of how the network is actually fundamentally operating. Why I say this is that this is, I think, the challenge that comes to us in terms of if you want to be able to understand actually how traffic is flowing, or in the example you gave, right, about Netflix or others, and it's not just about like the app ecosystem. It is fundamentally that there is actually a market push generally on all devices, all sorts of things to bypass the browser. Some entities come back to the browser, but there is a series of complicated business and economic interests in favor of you know, direct accessing services. In that situation, if you want to enforce rights, or if you want to be able to call for even business accountability, how do you do this? And I'm posing questions. Right now, literally, there are no answers. The first thing that I have actually sometimes recommended to people, I've recommended to uh, people in the internet infrastructure space and elsewhere, is actually now start going talking to regulators about how this is actually working. How is the nature of transit and peering changed? How are these sorts of arrangements restructured? What's taking place there? Because right now, they actually don't know. And their natural obligation is to try and regulate, right? And the regulatory uh, 
escalation is always easily possible. Many of you remember Wicket from a few years ago, the World you know, Conference on International Telecommunications and the ITU and the proposal to change fundamentally the, uh, the way of how uh, settlements and payments work in the telecom space. This is still a live question to many regulators and it's particularly there and I agree with you on the question about the nature of the stack, right? Like it's sometimes tricky to uh, place Google and say a Cloudflare or others in the same level. But for most government regulators or telecom departments, they're just saying, we have actually no ability to know what's going on in the network. We don't know how to be able to favor or put particular interests. That sometimes is often unfair and often is also driven from interests of surveillance, censorship, and many other questions there. The question I therefore like, you know, sometimes pose to the internet infrastructure sector is how can we address the fact that a lot of network traffic is off the licensed, regulated, directly controlled telecom providers who are subject sometimes to regulation on rights to network neutrality frameworks, sometimes regulated through other legal you know, mechanisms. What can we do there? The other question is sometimes this business and accountability, right? Uh, who is publishing, how, bus how businesses are operating, what's the principles that people try to apply in terms of how the you know, network infrastructure sector is working. Even the number of, for example, infrastructure companies who publish transparency reports when it comes to government data requests is something that only in the last two years has there's been a massive increase in that. So these are sort of initial questions that I'm like sometimes seized with and trying to grapple with. But I'd like, you know, love conversation on this. The, the main thing I keep posing to people is internet governance and our technical sometimes IGF way of understanding it versus what everyday citizens and their lawmakers, regulators, elected or non-elected, because not everyone's elected, let's recognize that, is that they want to address the larger entire ecosystem of how this is working. And there is sometimes, I think, a worry that even if it's five or six players, even if it's a situation where, say, one player will not take it all, and like, they want to be interoperable, they want to be able to favor say, connectivity with large cloud entities, what sort of regulatory like, you know, world are they directly living in? Already, there are telecom frameworks that apply, but this sort of question about, look, how do you operate? What norms apply to you? How are you accountable? And how can an individual user seek remedy? That's something I'm looking for answers for. And I believe they are there, but I'm actually generally curious to hear from others about if an everyday user or somebody wants to complain saying, I can't easily enter the market or I, I'm worried that you're potentially affecting my rights, how do they seek that, you know, achieve that remedy? Uh, thank you, Farzana, is speaking. Uh, so, uh, when here we are talking about the internet governance like the global internet governance uh, implications and um, when we come and talk about like the local policy and uh, regulating at the local level I think that's a whole set of other uh, conversation which is um, I don't think that uh, internet governance forum we can resolve that really so uh, if we can have your question at the, like a more global level of uh, how do we uh, resolve this issue and hold them accountable with internet governance um, mechanisms that are there, then m that might be like a, a better framework to work with. Uh, Colin, you have a question or a comment? Hi, this is Colin Curry for the record. Uh, I really liked that you brought up uh, the need for, for enforcing accountability standards for human rights amongst private actors. However, I do think that there is an alternative to regulation uh, or something that can be implemented in parallel, which would be better collaboration uh, between stakeholders such as companies, civil society, and national human rights institutes on developing kind of self-check mechanisms, such as human rights impact assessments or gap analyses to try to have some sort of alternative to kind of coming in with a, regu with a, re uh, a regulation that could have unintended consequences. And then for remedy, these, uh, these same kind of, kind of tools or, or mechanisms could be equally useful for identifying gaps in, in the provision of systematic and consistent access to recourse. So I just wanted to throw that out there. That's something that um, Article 19, I know that Access has done some work on that. So there is work being done in that space. Uh, it's moving slowly because it's quite difficult to develop these mechanisms, but things are progressing on that front. Thanks. And I, you know, I, I totally appreciate that. I think that what I'm also trying to encourage people to like, think about is that if we sometimes don't expedite these conversations or understand how can we push proactive, voluntary, 
business accountability with human rights, the challenge is that often you will deal with the regulators who take the worst examples of this and force bad regulation. And the thing I'll address, and this I think is sometimes very important for us to take on board, the difference between global internet governance and a local internet policy issue is super thin. If something is a huge issue for, say, the French government, the fact that France is hosting the IGF means it will enter the global internet governance debate. We have seen this with other governments, uh, I shall not name them, uh, who have done this often. So why I flag this is that sometimes we think that, look, it's not come up, it's a national regulatory issue, it will not affect how we have this conversation at the IGF, at, at ICANN, you know, in other bodies, not so much ICANN here, I know, but of course, at the internet engineering like, level. What I'm trying to flag here is we need to be able to understand that this will escalate quickly, and the fact of people not knowing how the network now operates is one of the biggest challenges. So what I'm actually recommending to people is talk more about what's going on there. The second one, as, as, you, as she rightfully pointed out, is actually designate. How do you deal with issues of human rights? How do you deal with issues of remedy? Who's accountable? How does that work? And I know this concerns something like technical questions, like a network administrator will say, frankly, that's not what I have to deal with, that my client is doing it and that's totally fine. Whereas there have been lots of examples most recently, particularly I know on hate speech, where internet infrastructure companies have had to say, yes, these are the policies we apply, this is how we operate. Um, for example, can certain customers use CDNs completely? Um, if that customer happens to be somebody directly engaged in human rights atrocity, how does that work? Are they like prohibited in other ways? How do we engage with that? I think that's an important question. The thing that is most useful also to perhaps do is to be able to say, this is literally how the internet operates today. This is how our network levels are operating. Be able to bring that public data forward. I think being able to publish not just transparency reports about government data requests or censorship requests, but able to go more on these is, this is the, the network topology or what we're dealing with, it would help the conversation. But yeah, I'm, I'm meaning to be provocative here because I want to prod people to say how they respond. Can I comment on that? Yes, and then we have a comment from the floor. So you go, and then you can. Go ahead, Jeff, please. Thank you. I suspect there's almost a misunderstanding around motives here. It's not that any of these service providers wish to do the wrong thing or even the right thing. It's actually not a concept. What they're trying to do paradoxically is actually doing exactly what users want, precisely understanding their needs and servicing them. And indeed, they're trying to crowd each other out in trying to make sure that they have an even better understanding of each and every user and they're doing exactly not only what users might want but what they might want in the next second or two. So when you talk about this sort of related social issues around what is their social responsibility, how are they motivated to do the right thing, I suspect that's a kind of conversation about Mars and Venus these companies just don't see the world that way. They see the world in a very pragmatic view of going, there's potentially 7 billion consumers. We wish to service each of their every need second by second. That's what we want to do. And it seems odd to try and say, well, that's the wrong thing. They would argue that's precisely the right thing to do, to do what people want. How would the governance debate intersect with that motivation from this new emerging content service industry, which they regard as being totally centered on doing exactly what we want rather than trying to paddle upstream and do things we don't want. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Um, so we have two comments from the floor. Uh, from the lady and then. Um, my name is Fia Lezhnevska from UCL uh, in London. There's two comments because I've just got one from the last point made. Uh, the first one I just want to ask um, really everything we've spoken about so far is Facebook and Google and I just wonder about the other service providers uh, in, in, in Asia, you know, like Tencent and Alibaba and stuff. Are they working exactly the same way, exactly the same models, exactly the same infrastructure? Is it developing exactly the same way? And uh, so are this, the questions the same? The second one, on, in terms of uh, governance, um, myself and Madeleine Carr here, we're working on a, 
um, IoT and uh, Global Internet Governance Project. Now, it's all very fine, everybody wanting to do what they wish at any time, but the point of government and the point of law is to prevent people doing things that cause harm to others. So one thing is uh, immediate harm to your neighbor, but there's also transboundary harm. And in terms of the international space, there's state responsibility uh, between countries. Uh, there's uh, state responsibility to try to ensure that non-state actors do not cause harm beyond uh, their jurisdiction. So there are legal, legal structures in place to hold to account the, what's happening. It, you can't build an infrastructure and just talk about it as if it had no external ramifications and that they are not connected. They are connected. And that's what we're, we've kind of waking up to it more and more and more. Uh, we do have an oligopoly and that makes it quite similar in some ways to the hydrocarbon uh, um, economies that we've had to deal with with climate change in some ways, in my perspective. But uh, yeah, so that's my... Uh, Jeff, would you like to take that first question and respond to the first question? Um, if, if the question was really about as Facebook, Tencent, and Alibaba any different from, say, Google, um, Amazon, Akamai, et cetera? The answer is, well, they're more like Google than they are like Akamai, um, but they have exactly the same interests, motivations, and, and raison d'etre. They're there to basically profile users, understand their needs, target ads at them, and try and create an environment where the advertisement is not something irrelevant. It's not spam. The advertisement is something you want. Is there any difference between Alibaba and Google in that respect? No, not really. They're exactly the same company doing exactly the same job in a different language, I suspect. Um, in fact, I suspect they're not even using different languages these days. So no, there's no difference. Jeff, is there an opinion or data? I'm sorry, your microphone was, was Is that badly an distorted. opinion of yours or do you have data on that? Or is this, is this like a study? Um, data in this area is remarkably hard to come by. Measuring users is remarkably difficult to come by. The major data that we use in terms of looking at the presence of these kinds of companies is actually their public shareholder value and the size of the company compared to other companies. It's also looking at their reports where they have to file reports, as in the case of America, to look at their reach and extent of activity. But when you say, can I measure users? Um, that gets a little bit difficult on an ethical basis, on a practical basis. You know, these are difficult issues to actually expose precisely what you and I are doing and understand our behaviours at that level. Thank you, so. So, so if you also asked, are, for example, Asian tech companies, are others trying to copy the bigger players in terms of also building production networks, trying to keep users in uh, as much of their network in, in infrastructure as possible while collecting data? If that's your question, that's also partly, that is true. I think the challenge is within China domestically, that's a really tricky place, not just for data, but in terms of incentives, just given how the Great Firewall and other things work. So I'm just very hesitant to looking at how that happens there. But if you look at e-commerce behavior across the remaining part of the region, and I, this is again one of the things where I say it's not empirical, uh, this is uh, opportunistic data from speaking to many CTOs and network administrators and some investors. Some of this is public in financial calls and investment uh, earnings calls is that they're all investing massively to try and keep people on their infrastructure. There's a lot of tension, particularly sometimes, and many of them work with the larger players, including Akamai, Cloudflare, and others, but the quite a few, especially larger e-commerce players who say, we want them to access on our infrastructure, sometimes set up consor consortia, including with investment firms from China, particularly Alibaba, SoftBank as well, which invests massively in that space, but that's taking place. So I don't know that fully answered your question. That doesn't go towards advertising practices and others, but just on the issue of how they operate at a network level, they're fairly similar, and they're all envious of the production network capability of some of the big companies. And I have forgotten your second question, so if anyone on the panel remembers and would like to take the second question. 
Would you like to uh, restate? It was more of a, an observation about the um, responsibility in relationship to uh, building an infrastructure. I build a road, I put cars on it, it kills people. A state has a, role, a responsibility to protect its citizens. At the global level, we have international law where there's a recognition of state responsibility to not cause transboundary harm. And that's filtered in through um, various legal transnational uh, mechanisms, standards, uh, hard law, soft law, to try and ensure that businesses are held more accountable for their actions. And if we're seeing increasingly, because there's more, more data available, more evidence, that the ways in which um, the larger internet is used and the new technologies that are being on brought on board are having negative, particularly around human rights impacts, but also environmental impacts. That's in breach of existing international laws, which countries are signed up to, many of them have signed up to, and they have to be held accountable to that. And I just wonder, where that falls into your discussions about internet governance, because in my discussions about internet governance, that's in the frame. You know. um, thank you, Farazani, speaking. Uh, so basically, in my personal opinion is that we are at a global internet governance is not a vacuum of lawlessness or normless. We have, as uh, also Ted uh, mentioned, uh, there are various uh, norms uh, within like the internet architecture, for example, um, the manners and uh, various norms that the businesses have to, well, they don't have to abide by, but they do or there are like some soft uh, enforcement mechanisms for them, so reputation-based. And it's not, I don't think that they are uh, functioning or operating in, a, uh, in anarchy. So, <laughs> but Ted, would you like to? Uh, <laughs> would I like anarchy? Uh, no, this is Ted Hardy and uh, I'll stand up. Anarcho-syndicalism was a good idea, but it didn't work. So um, I, I will go with, uh, no, I would not like anarchy. Um, I, I think, though, that there, was, there were two questions in your second question uh, in, in the guise of a comment, and one of which is, is there anything we're doing about any of this? That was sort of uh, a big part of your second question. And the second uh, part of your second question that I think was directed to us is, is what's actually happening uh, falling within state purview, or does it fall somewhere else? Um, and to, to take your state purview, the answer to that is sometimes, right? If, if what's going on on the network is damaging in a way um, that is uh, harming something which the state has a duty and has taken up the duty to protect, um, then you may invoke the state to, to engage in that protection. And a good example of this is sort of the toxic behavior that um, Jeff was talking about at the very beginning, part of which is um, uh, evidenced in DDoS attacks, right? You can say, hey, uh, this DDoS attack uh, harmed my business because it prevented me from getting customers, and I can point, because I can see the source addresses and I know where it came from, uh, I can point to where it, it, it arose from. We're going to assume for the, for the moment that we had some way of assuring ourselves of those addresses with the return readability or something. Um, and then you can go and say to the state, hey, you should track down who did this and make sure that they don't do it again. Um, realistically, you have to be at a very large scale of attack over a long period of time to invoke the state for that because it happens very frequently and most states' ability to, to engage in that remedy is relatively limited. Um, they, they don't have the technical um, capabilities to, to do that and often the traffic crosses territorial boundaries. And in, in those cases, they have to invoke very, very large-scale methods to, to send the, uh, the requests through um, uh, treaty obligation uh, mechanisms to the other states to get this done. So it's, it's possible, but uh, it takes a fairly large level of harm to invoke the state in cases like that. Uh, so it, it's definitely there as a mechanism, but it's, a, it's heavyweight and hard to invoke. Um, the second thing is, are, are we doing things about it? And the answer to that is, is yes, but that's because many of the things that we see um, that used to be fairly effective attacks are things that we can actually say, look, if, if you invoke uh, the correct filtering mechanisms on your outbound traffic, you can reduce the harm to the rest of the world. We 
we, we use the incredibly easy to understand argument that you should implement BCP 38 because we're obscure geeks and we apologize for that. But what it really means is if you're sending traffic to the network that you don't think you ought to be sending, you should stop. Um, and the, the, the other thing is there's a bunch of other mechanisms like that that have been introduced over the years to, to do return routability checks and otherwise maintain the fact that DDoS is less and less effective. There's an arms race there of people who control larger and larger botnets, um, but that doesn't mean we've stopped our side of the, of the race in trying to make the protocols more and more resilient against it. Uh, there's work going on in the IoT space to make them less effective as, as vectors. There's work going on in the regular routing space. Um, it, it really is going on all the time. Um, and that effort to clear things of toxicity um, will probably have to uh, use both that system of technical response and occasional state action uh, going forward. Um, Madeline, do you have a comment on this issue? Yes. Okay, great. And then we go to AFF. I'm sorry. Yeah, I, I just wanted to, I really appreciate your comments and very interesting, but I think it veers off a little way into cybersecurity because I think what, what Fair was referring to was not malicious actors. It, she, she's talking about industrial policy, about, um, you know, about trade policy of legitimate actors. And I just thought it might be interesting to bring in, because I know he's sitting in the front row there, Blaine Haggard, because this is basically what, you know, this is what, <laughs> sorry, Blaine, because <laughs> I know he works on that. It's <laughs> okay, let's see. Let's see what I can come up with. In, what I can come up with in five seconds. I, um, I, I guess essentially the only thing that I can, I can think about, and maybe you can tell me if this is what you were thinking about, is that essentially what, you know, basically whose responsibility is it not to just to deal with essentially attacks like that, but in, in, setting, in, in setting the overarching framework for these things, especially for something like, like the internet that's, that's as, as President Macron pointed out yesterday, has become much more uh, it's become it's become much more than kind of a technical thing. It's essentially become the 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 groundwork for all of society, uh, economically and so on. So it, it, it comes back to the who is responsible, who should be responsible for essentially exerting kind of the structural power because these rules are going to be set by somebody, and the question really does seem to be who's going to be sitting. So I mean, internet governance obviously, and I don't, I don't it, it isn't dead. It's the question is, is who's going to do it and in whose interest? Um, is that kind of what you were going for? Yeah, I don't know. So, so basically, I, I think the argument seems to be is that, um, it, is that it comes back to a question of legitimacy. When you're dealing with like very specific kind of technical issues, you can kind of claim a legitimacy there. But beyond that, if you've got something that's reaching so far beyond, uh, you know, so far beyond just kind of a communications network, you know, you have to go back to a, a deeper, more fundamental democratic legitimacy in the case of democratic societies. So, so I have to, to be almost as challenging in Jeff in my response to this, and that is the democratic societies derive uh, their legitimacy from the consent of the governed. Is that correct? From the governed. The consent of the governed. Yeah, yeah, citizens. So if a company has the active consent of its user, how is that different? How do, you, how, do you, how do you establish that you have the consent of the user? And who is your user? Terms of service, obviously. No, so, and why I ask this? Because this has been the challenge, I think, and like to, be a, to, to argue sometimes is to say in the larger players is to assume it's always coming from the users. And you've had users in social networks say we're forced to sometimes use this, or we use it. We haven't consented to, say, Facebook's uh, real name policy, for example. I think it would be easier sometimes for, 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 for especially people in the network connectivity space to come and say, we're subject to law, we're subject to, for example, sanctions law. If you show me a couple of providers who work with Iranian authorities, I'll buy them a cake, and then I'll you know, get them bail money, because the US DOJ is going to target them immediately. What kind of cake was it? Um, sorry. Uh, if you don't the, the point that you're making is that, oh, sorry, Ted Hardy again. The, the point that you're making is that there there may be ways in which to structure that consent so that it's acceptable to the rest of the society to know that this person did in fact consent to something, right? We, we have that in a whole variety of ways uh, in sexual relations. It's, it's evolved a great deal over the past 20 years of what consent has to be active and continuous and all of those things. And there's a real question here about whether the consent of somebody is something that can be structured in a way so that it is accepted or whether we're always going to have this, well, this didn't count as consent 
because uh, the user doesn't understand the ramifications of it. And there's a huge question of, of free will. If they don't understand the ramifications of that, how do they understand the ramifications of the consent of the government? All right, I have to moderate now. Uh, so, um, I, yeah, and uh, there is, okay, so EFF Australia, I think you had a comment like, Half an hour ago, um, yeah, yeah <laughs> but forty-five minutes. And then Pablo wants to. Okay, so she has only Madeline has only two words. Okay, two words: informed consent. And now it's your turn. Great, thank you. Um, I keep hearing the term multi-stakeholder and IGF. Um, we had a representative from Cloudflare here. However, where are the representatives from these other companies that we're talking about? Um, are we doing ourselves a disservice by not engaging enough with these organisations? By not engaging, are we creating a self-fulfilling prophecy of Jeff's? <laughs> On to you, Jeff. Jeff, you can't I'm sorry, I don't think they have an interest in engaging in this. Um, the issue around them? informed consent is, is, is actually remarkably informed. And what we're talking about, I suppose, is as we enter this new information age, private companies are actually more efficient in understanding the individual needs and obtaining individual consent than governments. They're more effective at maintaining relationships with hundreds of millions of end users than governments. And now comes, I suppose, the, the dramatic tension between, can, between catering to the needs of the individual versus catering to the needs of the society at large, the public space. Because when private companies work around the public space to directly have hundreds of millions of relationships with end users with their consent, the loser in the public space, the loser is the common space that society is thriving. And now the real task for government is even harder than before. It's about consent of individuals. They're quite happy to give their consent. It's perhaps not even about informed consent. It's about the tension between reaping and pandering to the needs of individuals versus understanding and ensuring the health and well-being of our public space. And I suspect in the last five years, the real loser in all of this is not me. I'm like, I can buy whatever I want in microseconds these days. I'm just fine. But the public space in which I live in is now shattered, eroded, and destroyed. And that fills me with great sadness. And that, I think, is, is where it's held miserable. Thank you. Okay, thank you, uh, Jeff. Uh, Pablo, you have a comment? Well, I think, um, and uh, conscious about the time uh, and wrapping up, I think this is all about breaking silos. And, and, and part of, of it, I think, is the, the difference between private, private self-interested business commercial spaces and that one that has a public effect and require public interest considerations. And then whether you delegate your rights of direct participation to governments to regulate, or you go through the cost and board burden to proactively um, sort of have a say in, in the decisions, provided there is a space for that in a multi-stakeholder setting. So for me, uh, the answer to the question of internet governance uh, becomes irrelevant because all these private interest considerations and the evolution of those practices is definitely not. I think we, we really need to um, invent sort of those spaces where uh, the, the different interest groups will collide and, and define how this will move forward. And, and I think that's, that's very important to start this conversation here, uh, which, which you, you brought, and, 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 and that's fantastic. But the, there is an endless sort of series of of considerations that, that we need to um, start thinking about.
Okay, yes, uh, thank you very much. Actually, the intention of this session was to start the conversation and of course we are going to come up with this accountability institution of the whole internet and you should all be involved and we will have a multi-stakeholder governance. I sound like Macron now, but it's the opposite kind of. But we need to, so we need to, I, I believe that at IGF we are here to talk about policy issues and, and governance problems and think about how we are going to resolve them with the mechanisms that we have, which is like the bottom-up, multi-stakeholder approach. Or if it's not multi-stakeholder, then I don't know, call it something else, but not government regulation. That will not be transnational. That will not give us the interconnectedness and the... Uh, open internet that we want. I believe that's my personal uh, opinion, but someone wanted to comment. And uh, yes, please, go ahead. Hi, my name is Catherine Tao, try to be quick. So I just wanna have a quick comment uh, to the two ladies there who asked about uh, the operating or commercial model of uh, Tencent, Alibaba, like Chinese tech companies. So my quick comment is, uh, I think there's a difference between uh, 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 commercial companies uh, operating in democratic society and then uh, who respect rule of law, have independent judicial system, and the companies who operate under authoritarian uh, countries. And the reason I say that is because, which is true that what Jeff said that, you know, they when they were startups, you know, there are also a lot of startup uh, now in China, they're competing for market share. And when they're trying to gain market share, they only have commercial interests in mind. And then, sure, yes, that's their only goal, right? So then uh, maybe political sensitivity is less of a concern. But then there's also a case that Biden recently got punished by the government. They lost, they basically have to close the whole website, which is like ranked the top app in China. And, um, and then uh, so if the government wanted to punish Tencent, they can just uh, issue a directive and Tencent's uh, stock market price in Hong Kong will drop like three, five percent overnight. So I think that in uh, on democratic countries, the government, the state has different kind of power dynamic with um, companies, especially tech companies when they're very, very big. Uh, so this is a comment that I wanted to raise. Great, thanks so much. So this is like the last call for any comments. Then, okay, so I have proposed in the session description that we are gonna take a vote on um, whether you think that internet governance will be irrelevant because of uh, the traffic consolidation and this issue that we brought up. So this is one question. Do you think so? So this is a classic case for ITF humming. So it's a less, more anonymous way of giving your opinion. We speak, and uh, you know, it's not a technical uh, place. We, we, do, we say words. <laughs> so, okay, um, okay. So no one is humming. And then there is a, so my second, should, should we do something about this? Do you see this as a problem that we should pay attention to the traffic consolidation and we should like follow up and bring up the issue in the right venue? I don't know where the, those right venues are. Do you think so? Okay, yeah, yeah, oh, okay, great. I see some reaction, I'm great. So uh, just quickly, two points I think that, that I've taken from this uh, fascinating discussion. One is I think that we can drop the word traffic from this discussion and just talk about consolidation because it's very difficult. To, every time the discussion is at the traffic layer, we get into the yeah. content layer and, and the vertical integration. And then I think the other point, and I think Jeff raised it was data. I mean, it's very hard to sit here abstractly talking about the impacts of things when we have no data. So um, we should be new, more nuanced in the uh, conversation and uh, just kind of like separate the issues out. Uh, so I think in the, yeah. I think it's this access to okay. data. Okay, yes, I got the comment. Thank you. Thank you very much for attending.